Good morning, Facebook Live. Hello, Facebook. Hello, Instagram. Hello, YouTube. Marcus here from Aroma Time. Hey, just want to take a couple moments and um, talk about uh, some of the foods that are uh, being produced in China uh, or being shipped in, shipped off to China and then brought back to the U.S. Um, so I just wanted to, a lot of people are kind of shocked when I tell them where our food comes from. A lot of you know that I am into food transparency, food origins, serving better food, higher quality food. And I think right now is really a time that we all should really be knowing what we're putting into our bodies, where it's coming from, and really honoring our, our immune system and being able to put high quality food into our system. So um, I did a video yesterday about talking about my previous health ailments that I've had and I, that I was able to reverse all through diet. Um, when I was 28 years old, reversed everything through diet, including lifelong asthma, um, built my immune system stronger. I haven't had pneumonia since I was 28 years old and I used to have pneumonia. Literally every other year I would have pneumonia. I mean, growing up as a kid, it was terrible. Hospital nebulizer. It was, it, it was terrible growing up as a kid. I was always sick. My immune system was very depressed. Um, thus, I had asthma and a lot of other things wrong. And when I was 28 years old, I discovered the power of food and better food, higher food quality, better food. And this is the type of food that we serve here at the restaurant. I think everybody, um, especially right now, should be understanding what they're putting into their body makes a difference with their immune system. Uh, you, when you listen to the Hayes Health Gurus, South experts, a lot of them will tell you that if your first line of defense is your gut. And when you put crap food in, you're creating um, bad flora, bad bacteria, and you want to be able to nourish your body with, with higher quality foods. So the whole premise of Aroma Time was so, because Jamie and I were frustrated with re what restaurants were doing with food. We're still frustrated with, re with what restaurants are doing food. I think it's terrible. We just got back from a food show and the, the people that were in the health food section of this food show, the healthy pavilion, the healthy food show, everybody that was in there, like out of 60 vendors, there was like five or so, six or so, that to maybe 10 that we could actually buy their products because everybody else was was either lying, misrepresenting what they were serving. I mean, the, the stuff was just pathetic. I mean, there was dessert people in there, cake people, and they were doing nothing special. Um, oil companies that had nothing special. There were, it, it, was, it, was, it was terrible um, to see that this is what they consider to be healthy food. Jamie and I have very, very strict standards of food that we buy in the restaurant here. So I just wanted to talk to a couple minutes and talk about food that you might not know is produced in China or produced here in the US, shipped to China and shipped back. So. Um, I've always been a strickler on avoiding as many Chinese products as we possibly can because I feel that it's taken away from the American labor force, uh, especially when it comes to seafood. Seafood is one of the biggest things that's shipped to China and back. Chicken too, like when you when you go to the store and buy like Tyson chicken nuggets, I'm, Tyson might be the wrong brand, but just those, those brands in the store, a lot of that stuff is shipped to China, the chicken, it's processed, processed in China and then shipped back. So. I think right now the awareness is like, well, where's all of our food coming from? Where, you know, just because of what's happening with the coronavirus and everything, people are very conscious and very aware. I've always done it because I want to know that we're getting pure food, but I've also wanted to support the American workforce. I believe that's been a, a, a main mission of mine since day one. So for instance, calamari. Did you know that 90% of calamari in the United States is actually from China? It comes from China or India, China or India, comes most of the calamari. It's not American calamari, even though um, in California and in Rhode Island, we have two predominant calamari industries that do, that do supply calamari. Now, here's the catch with that. A lot of these producers, the big producers like Town Dock, Ruger's, the big producers of calamari that are catching calamari here in Rhode Island, here in the US, they're taking that product and shipping it to, off to China. They ship it off to China. China then, then will will process it, package it, put it into the box, to the package, the plastic, bread it, whatever, and then ship it back to the US. Now, people are saying, that sounds ridiculous, Marcus. That sounds like totally like absurd. Why would you take a product from Rhode Island and ship it all the way to China, package it, ship it all the way back? It's being done with chicken. It's being done with a lot of products that you don't realize. It's a lot of these, a lot of these products, because first of all, um, it's a lot cheaper to do that. It only takes 20 cents a pound. If you catch calamari in Rhode Island, let's say you have you know, 50,000 pounds of calamari in Rhode Island you just caught. Are you gonna pay an American $18 an hour to process that? Calamari happens to be a tricky thing to process. Or are you gonna ship it to China? 
the round trip shipping, shipping both ways, including labor, packaging, all the material, all that kind of stuff, 20 cents a pound round trip is all that it takes. That's it. So do you pay an American $18 a pound in Rhode Island, $18 an hour, $20 an hour in Rhode Island? So we always have had on our menu proudly caught and produced in the U.S., packet processed in the U.S. We use this great company called The Right Choice, Seafresh, uh, C- which is a company out of, out of uh, Point Judith. American caught, American processed. Now, when you go to the stores to buy these, like you could walk into... Restaurant Depot, believe it or not, has one brand of American caught and processed calamari, and they have all the other brands there. If you walk in and look, and they have Indian calamari, they have Chinese calamari, and they have the American caught and American processed. When you, if you're a chef and you walk in the frozen section and look in, in, in Restaurant Depot, you will see this, 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 and all of a sudden the price almost doubles. The price almost doubles because it's American caught and American processed. Not many chefs are willing to pay double for that. And when you look at the display at Restaurant Depot, you'll see tons of the other calamari, only one tiny skew of the American caught process because it's not a big mover. It's not a big seller. People, when chefs go in to, to a warehouse or, or they, they, they call their salesperson and their, sales, their salesperson knows, see the salesperson knows that they're going to lose business from that restaurant if they don't come in at the best price. So it's not normal for a salesperson to quote a chef, a restaurant owner, the highest price, American caught, American processed, the highest quality foods. They're not into quality. They're into the cheapest possible quote to get the business of the restaurant. Folks, a restaurant, if you don't know, is an extremely tough business to make money. It is very low margins. It's, it can be a lot of work. It can be very draining. The labor force, it, there's so many things that, that make a restaurant difficult to run that when a chef is posed with, hey, I can save $3 a pound, $2 a pound, 25 cents a pound, a dollar a bucket for oil, they will take the cheaper option. And the sales reps know that. So the sales reps come in every week. And a lot of restaurants work off of a bid system. So they don't care what oil they're buying for the fryer. It's, hey, if you can get me oil for 17 bucks, a, 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 a 35 pound pail again, let's do it, let's do it. And whatever vendor comes in that, that week with the cheapest price gets the business. For us, it's always been very different. Like, I wish I could pay 17 bucks. I wish I could pay $40 for those things of oil. We pay a ton more than that because it comes local. It's local sunflower, cold pressed. Um, it's unfined, unfiltered. It's pressed. Basically, when we order it, it's like that week they press the sunflower oil. They're always pressing sunflower oil. We've been to the plant. We've seen it. The sunflowers sit there. Um, the, 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 it, it's, it's an amazing, amazing product, but it's far off that reach of $17 or $40 a pail. It's a lot, lot more. And that's what we use when we saute. That's what we use when we cook our wings. But most normal chefs would say, well, no, that's, that's just way, 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 way out of my price range. And, and I don't understand what the value is. And we understand, Jamie and I totally understand the value of high quality food and it's food that we want to eat personally. And again, because I went through all these health issues at 28 years old, where I was able to change my diet and reverse everything, including asthma, lifelong, uh, lifelong asthma. I couldn't walk out of the door without my inhaler in my pocket. Um, I couldn't run. I couldn't, I couldn't bicycle. And as a kid, I was active, but I, I never did sports as a kid because I always had asthma. I always, I always, I couldn't, you know, I played little league. That's one thing, but you know, to run track or something else, I couldn't, I could run, I couldn't run a, 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 a loop around the, uh, the, um, the track because I would have asthma. So I, as a kid, I, I, my, I wasn't as active as I would have liked to have been. I was, or I could ski, do certain things. But I remember in my early twenties working in Colorado at a Keystone resort and skiing, I worked on top of the mountain at Apple Glow Stube, which was the restaurant on, on, on top of the Keystone Keystone Mountain. It's at 11,000 feet. At one point, it was America's highest restaurant. It might still be, elevation-wise. And we would get to ski all the time. And I remember my early 20s going out to ski Keystone. I would get exhausted and out of breath, and I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. And my asthma would kick in, and I'd have to have my asthma in my pocket. Folks, I've not touched my asthma spray since I'm, I'm 46 now turning 47, I've not touched my asthma spray since I've been 28 years old when I changed my diet. And when I changed my diet, I could no longer eat the food that I was cooking in the restaurants I was working at. I had to bring my own lunch. I couldn't eat the food because I knew how sick it was making me. And, and it was just running my immune system down. 
And of course I did other things too, a lot of positive mindset and I started exercising and, and really built up that and that's when I started running and I lost weight. Um, but as a kid, I wasn't overweight. I was just unhealthy as far as my immune system and the food I was eating. And of course, I was a kid. My parents didn't know, you know, it was, it was you know, you go buy soda, you go buy french fries, you go do this, you go do that. But as, because our parents didn't really understand the effects of food, because our grandmothers had pure food. Our grandparents had pure food. But as as this whole thing is 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 unfolding through, through you know, the, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s especially, Food just became such a commodity that um, that restaurants wanted the cheapest possible products, cheaper, 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 cheaper. Two thousand didn't help. Now, you know, the last the last decade or so, it's all it's just about maximizing profits, getting the cheapest possible food, cutting out the labor for workforce, and not only restaurants. A lot of prepared food comes to restaurants. These, I mean, you can literally open a restaurant. I was just at this restaurant show. I did three speeches, and I was listening to other to other um, speakers speak. Some other really great speakers speak, and there's people in the audience that are raising their hand and saying, you know. I'm opening a restaurant. I have zero experience. I have zero experience in the restaurant industry. I've never cooked before. What should I do? And the answers, this happened several times. These questions were asked to the speakers, these experts. These experts are saying, you call Cisco, you call US Foods, they still, they will send their, their quote unquote chef in, show you everything you can open up a box and literally just flash, package, open up, put on a plate. And folks, this is what it's come to. This is what the restaurant industry has come to. You have people that are opening restaurants that are just opening restaurants because they want to make money. They don't understand food at all. And they're calling these big companies to have this processed food walk in the door and just get opened in a box, flashed in a microwave, popped in the oven, open, thawed, and served. Folks, this stuff is highly, highly processed foods. This stuff is insanely processed. And if you don't think that what you eat you know, when you eat makes a difference, you're totally wrong. Um, I'm living proof of this. At 28 years old, again, I changed my diet and got rid of everything. So um, this is, you know, so for Jamie and I, this is like, food is a very personal thing. Food is one of the most intimate things that you can put into your body, one of the most intimate things we do, because you are what you eat. It becomes you. Um, so um, the, the original title was just what other foods come, what foods come from China. So calamari is huge. Calamari is a big thing. Caught here, shipped there, packaged there, and shipped back. Garlic. The Chinese have cornered the market on garlic. Now, garlic is, you know, a lot of places in China grow great products. I don't want to bash, bash China specifically. There's a lot of great um, farms in China. There's a lot of high altitude. There's a lot of countries, things that are going, a lot of great farmers, organic farmers. But then you have the total opposite side where you know there's such toxic things happening in China because they don't have an EPA like us and all of a sudden the rivers there's so many rivers in China that you you can't drink the water nothing lives in the water because the companies just dump all the chemicals into the streams into the rivers to the waterways and again I saw this again last week that one of the rivers all of a sudden just turned like red overnight and they're like trying to figure out what company is dumping product uh, uh, byproducts into this when you look at all the companies there's hundreds of companies on this river. So it's like, well, who's dumping stuff in here? Nobody really knows, but the water just turns red overnight. And if you lived in Ellenville um, from here, I've heard, I was not around, but you've heard stories of some of the old timers talking about how the streams here when the paper mills were here, the, the water would be a different color certain days because they would just dump stuff in. We don't typically do that in America, but our waterways still get, unfortunately, still get polluted because of agricultural runoff and things like that. But in China, they just still keep dumping and going. So a lot of this goes into the agriculture in China. Uh, garlic is one of those things that grows in the ground and absorbs a lot of things that are in the ground, um, as opposed to something that is a leafy vegetable that's not in the ground, in the soil, where the toxicity builds up. So the Chinese have cornered, I remember back in the early 90s, working at places, beautiful places too, amazing places, like five-star properties, like the Greenbrier, the Broadmoor, where we were buying cheap Chinese garlic. It was like four bucks a gallon, three bucks a gallon. It was in some insane cheap price. The Chinese have cornered the market on garlic for, for, for years, for years in restaurants and in America here. When you go buy prepared foods, all those prepared foods that you're buying, and it says garlic in it, it's most likely Chinese garlic, okay? So um, garlic, especially because it's a root vegetable, it's in the ground, 
will absorb a lot more toxins than something that's not in the ground. Um, so the Chinese garlic is still very, very, very predominant in a lot of, a lot of restaurants still use it. Um, it's every now and then the price will spike because they won't let boats in. They won't let the, they won't let the shipments in. But right now Chinese garlic is still a lot cheaper than American garlic. Um, I just looked uh, a little while, I don't have my computer in front of me. I looked a little while ago at a price comparison. It's almost um, American garlic, peeled garlic is like 115 a case, 110 a case. The Chinese garlic is like 75 a case. That's a huge difference when it comes to a restaurant. Again, when a chef, a lot of chefs every Monday they send out bids or the distributors know every Monday they have to send a restaurant a report or a bid order so they can get that bid for that week or that month. And folks, it's all about the cheapest product. Restaurants are all about the cheapest possible products they can buy. It's not about, well, just, like, let me tell you something. Most restaurants will never ever justify, well, we're gonna spend $45 more a case, $35 more a case for American garlic versus Chinese garlic. A restaurant just won't justify that. Um, so, you know, but Jamie and I, again, have a very personal conviction against all this. Uh, with this kind of food, high quality food, and that's why we do what we do. That's why we serve what we serve. And um, so you are what you eat. Choose your food wisely. Choose your food very, very wisely. Again, folks, we had a lot of people on today. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. Um, if you're watching live, drop a comment, hashtag live. Drop a comment of where you're tuning in from. I see people from New York, from the West Coast. Um, Jamie's in the office here tuning in. So um, just drop a uh, comment from where you're, where you're tuning in from. Jim Rose says, my garlic comes from the USA. Good job, Jim. Uh, California has a very uh, strong garlic industry uh, that just can't compete with the Chinese garlic, uh, just price-wise, just can't compete. Uh, there is local garlic, of course, uh, but local garlic has a season. It's not something that's here year-round. A lot of restaurants need to buy peeled garlic because we just don't have... We just don't have the patience or the workforce to actually peel garlic. So that's one of the downfalls of local garlic in a lot of restaurants. Um, in a lot of restaurants is because they just don't have the labor force to peel garlic. When I was in the early, early 90s, 90, 80, 80, 1990, 1991, at one hotel I worked at, we used to buy cases of American garlic. And we used to, you have to, you have to let it age, or you have to let it dry. You have to let it dry because you want to get the skin dry. You have to cure the garlic. And then you put it through a buffalo chopper, which is a big food processor. And you take the garlic, peel it, skin on and everything, skin on and everything. And you soak the garlic in water. The skins, skins rise and all the garlic drops. And then you pick off the skins and strain it and you have chopped garlic. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, it was a massive, massive um, food processor, buffalo chopper. So, um, so that's cool. Um, so other things that come from China. So if you were to go in, a lot of seafood is processed in China. A lot of seafood is actually raised in China, like tilapia, um, China, the Mekong Delta, um, the Mekong Delta, which is in, why am I drawing a blank in Vietnam? Vietnam, the Mekong Delta. The Mekong Delta is the, like the largest waterway out there. They do tons and tons of, of aquaculture through the Mekong Delta. And that is one polluted, polluted river. Folks, people live, people live in pole buildings above the Mekong Delta with no plumbing. They go to the bathroom, it drops down, it goes right into the water. And they're raising um, all kinds of fish. Um, when you hear the term Asian catfish, something like that, that all comes from this place. It all comes from Thailand, the Mekong Delta, from China. Tilapia. There are very few American tilapia farms. Very, very, very few American tilapia farms. They do exist. Um, there are some tilapia farms through Central America uh, and through South America, but the majority of the production of tilapia, again, comes from China or the Mekong Delta. And again, when a salesperson goes to a chef, goes to a restaurant owner and says, I got tilapia for you, they're not the only ones throwing a price out to that chef. There's two, three other distributors that say, hey, I got tilapia for you too. And they're not saying, oh, well, I got American tilapia and, and you know, this is six bucks a pound. You should stop paying $3.25 a pound for your tilapia and pay me seven bucks a pound for American, more sustainable tilapia. Those kind of conversations very, very rarely happen. So you have to trust the restaurant that you're going to. You have to trust the chef that you're going to. You have to understand what their ideas on food are and their philosophies. 
And even a lot of the best restaurants still cut a lot of massive corners. Even the best, best restaurants I've seen out there just cut. I've, I've worked at a lot of these very fine restaurants years ago and you buy, you spend the most money on you can on truffles and, and great, great small French produced extra virgin olive oil. And you buy all these boutique items and then you turn around and the rest of the kitchen is the cheapest possible processed foods that they can possibly buy. So be very, very careful, um, you know, just because some chefs, some restaurants just like to show the few of the highlighted flavors, like like um, uh, highlight ingredients, like farm to table. A lot of restaurants claim they're farm to table, they support local, but in the reality, they're supporting farm to table when there's so much zucchini out there that they're tripping over it at the farmer's market because there's so much of it and so cheap. Um, you know, so there's there's the farm to table restaurants that say it, and the farm to table restaurants that really the chefs that really go. And there's a lot of them out there that do an amazing job, folks. There's a lot of really awesome restaurants that are doing an amazing, amazing job year round, doing the right thing. The Hudson Valley here, we have two farm hubs. We have two great farm hubs um, that supply year round produce, year round almost everything. Um, I mean, the amount of local stuff we can get now is insane. Um, I talk to the drivers, I talk to the companies, and and you know, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff here in the Hudson Valley gets shipped to New York on a, New York City on on a daily basis because the market is in New York City. The more expensive restaurants are there, the 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 the, 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 the larger populations there. But the stuff is here and it's, it is available, totally one hundred percent available. Um, so that's the awesome part. So um, last week I told a story about how I ordered Alaskan Soul. I was sold Alaskan Soul. I was told you're the market, you're gonna love this. I know what you like and. The sole gets delivered to me, a product of Alaska, processed in China. And I showed the driver, I showed the driver the box and the driver was like, wow, I had no idea. So obviously I returned the box, but he's like, I had no idea that something would be caught in, caught in, Amer caught in America and then shipped all the way to China. Folks, this is a very common process in Alaska. Uh, even in Russia, Russia will catch stuff and ship it to China to process it again because it's so dirt cheap to process food in China. Same thing with our, all of our clothing manufacturers. Hopefully, this whole hopefully this whole Corona um, scare will 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 make some manufacturers realize that we need to bring the job force back to the labor force back to America. Um, and non-food, I know non-food like an American seamstress is a union seamstress is like thirty dollars an hour. A seamstress in China is 55 cents an hour. A seamstress in Malaysia is 18 cents an hour. Do you think Nike honestly lowered their prices when they, or, or any of these companies, Reebok or New Balance, do you think any of these companies lowered their prices when they were paying a seamstress $20 an hour years ago and they started paying them 50 cents an hour? That's a massive, massive, massive savings. Do you think those companies lowered their prices? No, they just kept increasing their profits. Publicly traded companies kept increasing their profits. They throw LeBron or whoever $10 million to do this and do that. And um, it's a very sad situation. So hopefully this thing will be like, well, gee, let's bring some of our jobs back to America. And of course, that's been our mission from day one here is you, we buy as many, as many American products as we possibly can if there's choices. Of course, buying brand uh, cognac, cognac only comes from France. Um, Chianti only comes from Italy, but that's, we have a ton of American wines. We have a lot of New York state wines, which we feel is super important to support our local wine industry, extremely, extremely important. In fact, we always have two or three or two or three, at least three glasses, sometimes four glasses of wine on our wine list that are always from New York. So that's just always a staple and always on our wine list. We were working with one of our clients, one of our coaching clients is Jamie and I coach, and he switched all of his wine lists not many wines, but six, seven, eight wines, to 100% New York Finger Lakes wines. I was like, wow. Um, so that was really, really a home run. Um, you know, when, when, you, when other people are like, yeah, I want to do this to other restaurants. So it's really a home run that we can influence people like that. So, but seafood, folks, seafood. When you're looking at seafood, especially shrimp, shrimp isn't really, isn't caught here and sent there because shrimp is just raised in China. It's raised in Malaysia. If you go on and do a search for Malaysian farm-raised shrimp, you will find how horrific what these companies do in Malaysia, how they how they just strip the land, um, they leave everything desolate, they they leave it polluted. You will find, and there's a reason why Malaysian shrimp is half the price of an American caught shrimp, an American process or something, uh, an American shrimp, a Gulf. There's a drastic reason because it's just that much cheaper, and there's just no regard for the environment. 
Um, and shrimp is one of those tough things where it's extremely hard to find a high quality shrimp to begin with. Um, wild harvesting shrimp is not a good idea. Farm raising shrimp is not a good idea. So you have to really balance, if you serve shrimp, you really have to balance the best of the farm raised or the best of the wild harvested. It's one of those things where I feel that shrimp is just, it, it's a hard thing to win with shrimp because of bycatch issues. In wild shrimp, the bycatch issues are atrocious. Um, you're getting seven pounds of unwanted bycatch for every pound in wild shrimp. Farm shrimp, you know, you can have sustainable, you can have organic, you can have you can have all the, all these layers of, of better quality, but at the end of the day, it's still farm-raised shrimp. So me personally, I don't really have, you know, the best answer when it comes to shrimp. I know the single best shrimp out there, the number one best shrimp out there that you can actually for the environment, for everything, is going to be Alaskan spot prawns. They come in season in September. It's a very short season. They get frozen, and there's typically not enough supply out there, and they are outrageously expensive. They're as, ex as expensive as lobster tails, and they're head-on, um, and there's just not enough to go around. That shrimp right there is the answer. If you eat shrimp, and you only eat shrimp five or ten times a year at home, and you want to eat the best shrimp, you buy Alaskan spot prawns. Main sweet shrimp, those little tiny salad shrimp, main sweet shrimp, are also a good alternative, but people don't want to eat small shrimp. Um, oxymoron there, small shrimp, or um, the same, same, same meaning. People don't want to eat small shrimp, but those little tiny main salad sweet shrimp are trap caught, which means they're not dredging the bottom of the ocean and causing habitat destruction. They're trap caught, which is fantastic. Um, so if you can get a hold of those main sweet shrimp, main sweet shrimp, those small shrimp, those are another great choice as well. But cold water shrimp don't grow as big as warm water shrimp. So you have these small shrimp. Um, and you have to be very careful when you read the ingredients on those because they a lot of those main sweet shrimp, they pump them to plump them. They're pumped so they plump them so they look bigger. So be very, very aware. There are some good natural brands out there that have none of those funky chemicals in it. Just make sure it's not a pumped main sweet shrimp but you can put those on your salad you can make shrimp salad out of those you can do some really cool stuff and they come already cooked which is great they come frozen and cooked so if you're at home if you're at home cooking this kind of stuff keep it in the freezer they're iqf which means individually quick frozen you take a handful out thaws in minutes and you put it in your dish and you keep the rest of the bag in the freezer so that main sweet shrimp are a big hit as well um so and typically the prices is, is good on main sweet shrimp because people just don't want small shrimp um when you go to the store to buy other seafood, it's very important just to look look, look at anything. Look at any labels of anything. Because by law, um, seafood and meats, they're supposed to tell you where it's caught, where, where, it's, where it's produced, or where it's the origin of it, and then where it's processed. So there's always, like on seafood, there's always two labels if they're processing it. Um, there's typically two, two, two disclaimers on there. Product of Alaska, product of USA, processed in China. Product of USA, processed in Russia. Product of Russia, processed in China. Product of the USA, processed in USA. It'll say that on packages. I can guarantee you, if you're going to Walmart to buy any kind of frozen seafood or fresh seafood, that they're they're looking, again, they're buying from companies that are getting them the cheapest possible products out there. They're not justifying something that's caught in America, higher labor force, safer. They're not justifying that. They're justifying the consumer walking in and saying, I want to go to Walmart, not to ShopRite. I'm going to Walmart, not to Wegmans. I'm going to Walmart, not to Albertsons. Walmart, not Piggly Wiggly. So the Walmart is very, very, very price conscious. The other grocery stores have to follow suit with Walmart. So if you want to buy higher quality, then you go to something like a Whole Foods. I was just talking to somebody this morning about how to buy how to buy wild salmon. You buy wild salmon frozen, caught in America, processed in America. You buy sockeye, coho, or king. Avoid kita, chum, silver. When you buy those species, um, a lot of people say they're too fishy and then they get turned off by it. And I can those, those sometimes are kita have very which has a higher oil content, so it can it can make that fishiness or increase that fishiness flavor, which people say, I don't like, because you're buying the cheapest, you're buying the cheapest one based upon price. You need to buy something that's more expensive and you'll have a much happier, much happier experience if you're buying something that's more expensive that's not quite as fishy. Because it's fishy doesn't mean it's bad, it just means the oil content's higher and um, the oil content, the oil flavor sometimes change in the fish. Because you want to expose to oxygen, air, it, it will uh, oxidize and that'll change the flavor of it a little bit. It doesn't make it bad, it just, 
changes the flavor. Okay, it's just not as good experience. So don't, if you're going to buy wild Alaskan salmon, do not buy the cheapest wild Alaskan salmon. And also look for if anything's like, if you walked into, a lot of people we know, it's like, oh Marcus, I, 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 I've been to Restaurant Depot. Restaurant Depot is a big warehouse across the country. We have one here in Newburgh. So um, I know a lot of people that go in there, regular consumers that go in there or people will ask to borrow my card here and there to go in there to buy something. And you can go in there and literally see a wild Alaskan salmon, but it's a very, Restaurant Depot, again, is probably the Walmart of food supplies. They know chefs are very, very conscious in price. So they will go there and they will absolutely buy, um, and they'll absolutely go there because they're price conscious. And so, so they're buying salmon from the cheapest possible supplies because they know that they're not, they're not gonna be able to, a chef like me is not going there to buy seafood, especially salmon. Um, it's just not happening. So they're going to the people that are just going in that are very, very price sensitive, super price sensitive. Um, a question from Heidi, what about Norwegian salmon? Second time I've been asked that this morning. I was on the phone with somebody this morning. They asked me about Norwegian salmon. This is a great, great point. Folks, Norwegian salmon is farm salmon. There is very, 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 very little wild Norwegian salmon. Very, 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 very little Scottish wild salmon. Very, 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 very little wild salmon in the Atlantic Ocean. The reason why this is, and I had a conversation with a fish guy on this the other day at the food show, because he's like, I don't take sides when it comes to wild or farmed, but he had both there. He had farmed and wild. He's like, I don't take sides. Maybe I don't know enough. And I said, you don't know enough. He goes, he made a comment like, well, you know, the salmon farms are our future. Here's the reality of salmon farms and the future of wild salmon. Every time you put a salmon farm in the ocean, in the bay, you kill off the wild salmon. They're taking salmon farms and they put them in the migratory path of the wild salmon. The salmon farms spew diseases out left and right. Did you know that every single salmon farm, every single salmon industry region has a mortality rate? Salmon die, they just die. If you drove by a cattle farm, a beef farm, and you saw half the cattle, or, or let's just say one out of 10 cattle were dying in, in, in ranches and farms and feedlots. One out of 10, you drive by and you see, all of a sudden you see like a feedlot and there's like a thousand cattle and you see, if you saw 25 dead cattle out of a thousand, you, that's only two and a half percent, right? That's a very, very low. You'd be like, man, what's going on here? I don't want to eat their beef. Salmon farms go up to 25%, 24% in Scotland mortality. The salmon just died, but they sink to the bottom. You don't see it. And it's in the ocean, so you're not driving by. And then they pump it out and they send it off to rendering plants or incinerate or do whatever. And then they start the process over again. All that disease goes into the ocean. Salmon swim by the farms to spawn. They go into the stream. They lay their eggs. The salmon die, the, the adults. The baby fry swim back down, go by the farms, and then the disease latch on to these baby, baby salmon. They don't have an immune system, not developed enough. If one lice, one lie, one lice, lice attached to is the salmon, that baby salmon, the salmon's history, and that happens constantly. What lice don't like is lice don't like fresh water. So when the adult salmon swims by the fish farm and gets lice attached to it, the salmon swims into brackish water and into fresh water going to the stream, all the lice die and, and, and fall off. But the babies don't swim back upstream. They swim into the ocean and live their life and swim their 2,000 mile journey to get back to the place that they spawned, that they were hatched, and they don't never have that opportunity. All these diseases, that the, the, the fish, the, the, the fish anemias, all, the, all these things, the, 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 the viruses, spread right into the wild salmon population, kill off the wild salmon. If you look at maps, graphs, Salmon farms became prevalent in the, they started in the 60s. They really became prevalent in the 80s. If you just graph, and John Robbins did this in one of his books, if you just graph out the life of the, 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 the more they ban, or when they started banning um, salmon farms, I'm sorry, sa salmon, um, salmon fishing, commercial Atlantic salmon fishing, when they banned that, they thought that was going to, you can still sport catch here and there. Um, even in Scotland and Norway, you can sport catch. It's a lot of money, and it's salmon that are already laid their eggs that are getting ready to die anyway. That's what we let you catch. It's called spent salmon. You don't want to eat spent salmon. Um, so when they put all these farms into place and stopped and stopped fishing it commercially, they would think that the population would spike, and it hasn't. The population keeps declining in wild Atlantic salmon. You look at Alaska, the population never declines. It's, a, it's just they have a quota system. 
fish go up, they spawn, they, they swim back down, they don't have any farms there, um, so the fish can't go in the migratory path. British Columbia, disaster. Farms came in in the late 80s, 88, 89. You look at Alexandra Morton, you look at any of her work. She's a marine biologist in British Columbia that went to watch the whales, to observe the whales. The whales are disappearing, bears are starving, the wild salmon population is diminished to almost nothing. The local fishermen there have nothing, but these greedy salmon companies, these greedy salmon farms, Grieg and all these companies are, that have come in, these Norwegian companies have come in and destroyed the wild salmon, destroyed it. And then they have the nerve to put on their website. Every time you buy a farmed fish, you're saving a wild fish. Total BS. Norway has no wild population to have wild Norwegian salmon. It's all farmed. Scotland, all farmed. The very, very few that get caught are from investment bankers that pay 10,000 euro to stand upstream and catch fish that are dying because they've laid their eggs already, spent fish. It's a sport fit, it's a sport industry, and it's, it's fish you don't even want to eat. There's very, 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 very few truly wild caught salmon available. I talked to Alistair last year uh, from a, 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 one of the distributors in Scotland for, for all kinds of fish, and he's the, he's the one who gets the, the wild salmon. And he said, Marcus, if I get a dozen wild salmon a year to sell, he goes, that's it, and they go to royalty. It's a royalty fish. They come in, it's, uh, it's 50 euro, 50 euro a pound, or 100 euro a kilo. He goes, that's the reality. When you get 12 wild salmon coming from Scotland a year to sell wholesale, he goes, that's it, that's all we have. He goes, Norway, there's a little more than that, and the price is maybe half that, but it's a little more. What's a little more out of 12 fish? It's not much, folks. It's not much at all. So we're not getting wild, we're not getting truly wild salmon from Norway and Scotland. There's a there's very, very small industry. There are small catches but it's nothing that really makes it here. We were at a food show years ago, a decade ago, and they had a wild um, Scottish salmon there. And I asked the guy, I said, wow, I've never seen a wild. He goes, yeah, and there's not much around, and we do have it. We have a, a small window where we catch it. And I go, so so, how much is this? How much, how much is this fish? And it was $30 a pound whole fish, whole fish, $30 a pound, which means you clean it, take the head off, gut it, you clean it, everything. You're now at... Um, you're now losing 50%. That $30 a pound just went to $60 a pound. No restaurant's paying $60 a pound besides maybe Thomas Keller or something and serving a, you know, a three ounce piece for, for 50 bucks. Nobody, nobody has that kind of money to do that. This is not what kind of industry the restaurant, the restaurants aren't about this. Certain restaurants can, but very, 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 very few. So Norwegian salmon, if you see Nor Norwegian salmon, this is a great question, Heidi. Norwegian salmon is always farmed out there. Scottish always farmed. Faroe Islands always farmed. Every single, every single um, um, region, every single salmon industry region has a mortality rate. They all have die off. They all get, they all get, have disease. They all, this happens across the world. Even the most sustainable ones, Loch Duhart, which calls themselves the most sustainable most sustainable salmon farm out there. You go on YouTube, you do Lock Do Heart mortality rate, and you will see the locals filming videos of Lock Do Heart pumping out, pumping out dead salmon into trucks. You'll see this throughout any industry. You can find out through any parts of the salmon salmon realm. I'm very passionate about salmon, by the way. This has like been uh, over 20 years. I've been really advocating salmon. I told this guy the other day, who has had who had wild and and farmed, who says I don't take sides. I just you know we sell both. And I, I spent five minutes with him and he was like, his jaw dropped. And I said, if you had eight hours, I could talk to you for eight hours on salmon, on this, all right? I can talk, I mean, I've been studying this for 20 years. Um, food is our passion here. Food is really our passion. Pure food is our passion. Whether it's the cooking oil, whether it's the salt, whether it's the sugar we use, whether it's the truffle oil we use, the olive oil we buy, whatever it is, food is our passion, folks. And I can talk on and on and on about any ingredient, chocolate, I got hours to talk to you about chocolate and, and chocolate to buy, chocolate not to buy, slave labor, raw chocolate, high antioxidants, wild chocolate, um, cultivated chocolate, regions that don't even can't even grow wild chocolate, um, production regions. Um, it's uh, companies that are misleading you on their chocolate. I can talk for hours on that. This is our passion. Food is our passion. So um, we really appreciate all the support that we get from all of you. We really um, you come in to eat. We really really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people watching today.
I know I'm going on and on. Does anybody else have any questions that I can answer right now? Um, hopefully that answered your question, Heidi, on Norwegian salmon. Na say no to Norwegian salmon. Alaskan salmon only. Buy it frozen, caught in Alaska, processed in Alaska, or caught, processed in America. That's the best way to get the highest quality salmon. Avoid Kita, avoid silver, avoid anything that says Kita, Chum, or silver. Avoid it. Buy Coho, Sockeye, or King. Coho and Sockeye are going to be the easiest to find. Those are the two easiest ones to find in the store. ShopRite, every now and then, we'll have a brand called Alaska Gold, which I love Alaska Gold. Alaska Gold is a line, a line caught fishery, which means they're throwing lines out and catching as opposed to nets. One of the things that, um, that determines the quality of sushi fish, especially salmon, um, is how the catch method is. How are the fish caught? So most sushi fish are caught one hook, one line, reeled in, and, and that's it. Um, there's a thing called gill netting. Gill netting is where they take drop nets right in the, right in the, right in the river or the ocean. They drop a, a series of nets. It's a wall. The holes are only a certain size, right? They're a certain size. So the fish go to swim. They swim through the, through the hole. And what happens when they get locked in, their, their gills get locked. And it's called gill netting. So the fish can go forward a little bit and then stops it. And as soon as the fish goes to retract, the gills of that fish get locked in there. So they get gill netted. And that fish just sits there and flaps for hours and hours and hours and hours until they bring up. A lot of them will get deceased in there. Um, they get very, very stressed out. They get bruised. A lot of kita salmon is caught that way. It's gill netted. They drop it in the ocean. Even in the Yukon River, it's gill netted. And the fish just sits there in agony for hours and hours and hours trying to get out. And then keep, more fish keep swimming in and swimming into this net. And they just, that's the reality of, of gill netting. So we buy, even if, so we take it to another level on, on wild salmon as well. We buy no wild salmon that's netted. All of our wild salmon is truly line caught wild salmon from, so from a line caught industry. One hook, one fish, troll caught, it's there. One hook, you pull it up and that's it. And the fish is caught and the fish does not go through hours and hours of stress. Long line fishery is another where they string, you know, literally a mile of hooks, thousand feet of hooks, a thousand yard, whatever. And there's a thousand hooks there. And that line stays out there. It's called long line and they bait every hook, goes out, it sits out there for hours upon hours upon hours. This is why when you buy mahi mahi, some mahi is twice the price of other mahi right? It's the catch method. It's all the catch method. It's how the fish is caught determines the price if it's coming from the same region. If you're sitting there having guys like line catch, line catch versus dropping a thousand hooks, there's a massive labor difference, right? A massive labor, a massive production difference. You have to charge twice the price, but the fish that are on the lines are sitting out there caught all day and sitting on these hooks all day long until they reel them back in. Now, I've spoken to a commercial fisherman who's a good friend of mine who used to live here in Elm, but doesn't live here anymore. He's like, Marcus, I mean, I so agree with your, your stance on, 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 on long line. He goes, it's pathetic what happens on long line. He goes, we used to fish for mahi in the Carolinas. And if you're on the wrong side of the current, meaning that the mahi are on the left and the current's here and there's shark on the right, mako shark or some other shark on the right or some other species of fish, on the right, and you don't know where you're, you know, it's a, he goes, it's a crapshoot. Drop the line, and you don't know until hours, hours, hours later what's on the hook. See, when you drop one line, one hook, you reel it back, you know it's on the hook. You take the hook out and drop the fish back in, the fish swims away in most cases. But when you're long line fishing, the fish sit out there for hours upon hours, and then you reel them back in, and you realize that you have 90% shark as opposed to mahi. And these folks, this doesn't, this doesn't seem that complicated, but it is. When you reel fish back in, oh, we got fish. Let's clean it up and let's process it. These boats are designed to do one fish only. That's why shrimp boats, you catch all this shrimp and all this bycatch, they throw all the bycatch back. It could be dead because it's raked up and tumbled in the bottom of the ocean. So all that stuff could be dead. Um, or if it's alive, it gets all thrown back. They don't have the facility to process anything but shrimp. Mahi Mahi, they're there to only get Mahi Mahi. They're not there to get shark. That's not their mission. They don't have the facilities. They don't, don't process them. They don't, they're not there to get another species of fish. It's only Mahi Mahi. That's it. So whatever's not Mahi Mahi gets thrown back. Now, when he told me what they do on these boats, because Marcus will catch all shark. He goes, but each hook costs a dollar. These commercial hooks cost a dollar. He goes, to save the dollar, which, you know, you could have hundreds of hooks on a line. To save $100, 
what they do is they actually instead of t- taking the taking the hook out, um, you know, of the fish, they actually just cut the jaw of the fish. They'll just cut the jaw of the shark and throw the shark or the fish back into the ocean, minus the jaw, minus that part, and then have the hook and then obviously take it off then, and throw the fish back in because the fish dies. These fish are dead. You're missing half a jaw on your fin on, the, on a shark. That's it's, it's a goner. It's done. And he goes, it is horrific to see what happens. So, but this is what you get, what you pay for. When you're buying cheap food, you're supporting the system. You're su- and I understand a lot of people don't understand the system. They just don't, because no, nobody tells us this. Nobody, even going through culinary school, going through culinary, nobody told me any of this kind of stuff. Nobody, they don't teach this kind of stuff. This is stuff as a chef that I had to go out and learn because I was interested in serving the best quality food because I knew that what I was eating wasn't good for my health. And I gotta tell you, there's a direct correlation between healthy body and healthy planet. The healthier foods you eat, the less processed they are, the better Mother Nature loves us because Mother Nature, um, you know, you process something more and more and more, you have byproducts. That's just what happens. And that byproduct goes into the land, it goes into Mother Nature. The least processing of food, the better off we are, um, the better off Mother Nature. So healthy body, healthy planet, there's a direct correlation between the two. So, um, that being said, I've been on a long time. There's been a lot of viewers today, so I really appreciate everybody very much. Thank you very much. Hopefully, how you answered your question about Norwegian salmon and anybody else about salmon. I'm going to be doing a lot more videos that are getting more intense like this, especially with the coronavirus coming up and just educating people about your food, your food choices, eating healthy, supporting your immune system. If anybody's asking, like, what supplements I'm taking right now, I'm taking zinc every day, zinc lozenges every single day. Every health expert out there says zinc lozenges. Take them. Take them, take them, take them. I'm taking... I don't take spirulina that often, but I'm taking spirulina every day now. Spirulina activates your immune system. I've read some studies out there. Um, if you do spirulina immune system, you Google that, you'll find some some scientific studies out there of this algae, um, this algae that is amazing. It can come in tablets. That right there is amazing, amazing for your immune system. Um, vitamin C. Vitamin C is something, I have this great vitamin C that I just t- drop a little bit into my water and then drink the water. You can take capsules if you want. That's really cool. Something I've always, always taken is chlorella. This helps with the electromagnetic frequencies and balancing your body. Every time I'm on a plane ride, I um, take this, I o- overdose. I don't overdose, but I take a lot of chlorella. Every day I take like four or five of these. But if I'm on a plane and I'm traveling, chlorella is the one thing that I uh, make sure I always, always, always have, all right? So, and again, thank you for tuning in, everybody. I got a lot of people tuning in um, from all over the place, from all over um, California, New York here, um, in the South. Um, hi, Aaron. Aaron's an employee of ours. Hi, Barbara. Barbara lives local. Um, Lily, Lily's on. Hi, Lily is in, um, in uh, um, Colorado. 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 So that's awesome. So again, folks, um, if you want to go back and watch this, I'm just talking about the foods that, that we don't think of that are processed in China, caught in America, shipped to China, um, um, or just made or just processed or, or raised in the Mekong Delta, uh, which is a very polluted waterway. And just folks, restaurants are always price conscious. Sales reps walk into restaurants all the time, and it's always about saving the restaurant money. It's not about serving a higher quality food. It's about saving the restaurant money and buying the cheapest possible product that fits into their, to, to their realm. So um, thank you. Uh, if you were watching this live, just do me a favor and drop a comment, hashtag live. If it was on the replay, hashtag replay. The more you comment, the more people will see a video like this. And I feel a video with this kind of content is super important, especially now with the coronavirus going around. You are what you eat. Build your immune system up. Build your immune system up. Build your immune system up. Eating high quality foods. Avoid white flour. Avoid white sugar. Avoid fried foods. Avoid just highly processed foods. You know, eat as natural as you can. You know, eat you know good high quality protein if you're eating protein, uh, uh, animal or or, or 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 fish. If you're vegetarian, you lots and lots of options out there for high quality protein. Simple. The the simpler food is prepared, folks. The simpler it's prepared, typically the healthier it is. All right. So. And that's a general rule. The less you do to the food, the better off you are. So if you've ever noticed, I've always said for years, my food is simple. Aroma Times food, my food philosophy is simple food. Get high quality food, let the flavor shine, peak season, don't do much to it. There's no reason to do it. You let the flavor shine in the food. A little bit of high quality, super high quality salt um, goes a long, long way uh, in food. And we use um, Redmond Real Salt. I don't know if I have a package of Redmond Real Salt around. Um, we travel with it, we take it everywhere. 
Um, Jamie has always in her pocketbook the Redmond. Oh, there we go. We got a bigger container over here. Redmond Real Salt is from is from Utah, folks. It's from the Utah Flats. Redmond Real Salt. This salt has a color to it. If you can see that, it is um, got speckles in it because it's not all salt. There's minerals in here. There's other things in here besides just salt. When you're buying purely white salt, it is highly, highly processed. Highly processed. This salt here comes from the mine in the ground. They take out chunks, and then they, um, here's a small container. Redmond has these small containers. In fact, Redmond used to send us this. We should get more of these from Redmond um, to give out as samples because these are great to carry in your pocketbook or, you know, with your traveling. We don't take this traveling. We take the small one. So when you see the salt in the mine, you take a chunk of it out and you grind it. That's what goes into here. There's nothing more, nothing less. Just they have a kosher grind, they have a coarse grind, they have chunks, they have fine grind, they have all different grinds. This is what we use. If you put this into water right now, put this into water and stir it up, spoon into water, you will notice it won't dissolve all the way because the salt will dissolve, but the minerals won't. All the minerals, there's like 54 minerals in here. The minerals will not dissolve in the water. And Folks, I worked. With, uh, I had a chef that worked for me, a good, really good chef years ago, really good chef, highly qualified. Um, Heidi, Heidi, if you stop down, I'll give you some of this salt. Heidi, I know you live local, so if you stop down, I will totally give you some of this salt. Come down and grab some whenever you want. I'll give you a container of it. I'd love for you to try the salt too. So, um, I had a chef work for me years ago. It was really a highly qualified chef, highly qualified chef, and he was like. He was mad that I had this salt. He was like, I don't like this salt. It's not, it's not white. It's not, this is a chef who was like working in New York City, making some really fine food, nice restaurants, beautiful restaurants, uh, expensive restaurants. He worked for Gordon Ramsay too. And he's like, I don't like this salt. The, it, it doesn't look good on the food. You salt something, you can see the little specks. I'm like, welcome to my world of real, healthy, natural food. Food that is not processed. Welcome to my world of that. We're not changing salt. But this is how most, this is the mentality of most chefs. Even somebody who worked for Gordon Ramsay. Like, you think Gordon Ramsay has this great food. Folks, Gordon Ramsay is in the same boat as every other restaurant. You buy a couple of, you buy the truffles, you buy the, 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 the glitzy, glamorous things, then you turn around and you buy the cheapest possible things throughout the rest of the restaurant. The cheapest salt, the cheapest frying oil, the cheapest flour. There's bromide in every flour product in his restaurant. I don't want to pick on Gordon Ramsay specifically, but this is like there's lots of, every flour product is bromiated. Look up the dangers of bromide and bromiated flour. We have no bromide in the restaurant. Look at the dangers of that. Look at the dangers of all these things. Folks, food is our passion. Food is really, really, really our passion here. And um, you can ask me about every ingredient. That's why we have 100% transparency on every single thing we do. 100% transparency. I will show you what is in something. I will show you, here's the package, here's this, here's that. Here's where we bought it from, here's this. 100% transparency. Uh, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't hide anything here. So super important. Folks, and you have that right. When you go to a restaurant, you have that right to actually know what's in your food. It's called truth in menu. These are there's laws set up. So if food is fried, grilled or whatever, the restaurant needs to tell you and be upfront with you with what they're doing, the way, the way it's cooked and with what's in it. You have every single right. And when I go to a restaurant, sometimes I'll say, you know, I want to know if this is this. I've had restaurants look at me and say, is this an investigation? No, it's I'm concerned. I'm a concerned I'm concerned about my health. I'm concerned about the food I put into my body. I'm concerned, and it's not an investigation. It's me being, it's me being conscious. And the more you ask a restaurant, the more they'll get the picture. The more they'll understand. I know I've been on a long time. There's just viewers are still on here, so I really, really appreciate it. So if you're willing to listen, I'm willing to talk. Years ago, Jamie was avoiding soy. She was avoiding soy. She was going having having a skin condition, and we we're doing a, an elimination on things. We we're avoiding soy. And we went to a very fancy French restaurant here in the Hudson Valley. Very fancy, very expensive, a lot more expensive than Aroma Time. And um, I said to the waiter, I said, she's avoiding soy products. Um, what do you cook with? Oh, we cook with olive oil. His French accent. Oh, it's olive oil. I said, what's in this Caesar dressing? It's olive oil. What's in, it's olive oil. We don't use soy oil. So I grabbed his arm and I said, listen. I said, if she gets soy oil, She's gonna start itching. I was like, she's gonna start itching like this. Okay, one moment, let me go check with the chef. He comes back two minutes later, he goes, I am so sorry. I said, what happened? He goes, oh, we cook with soy oil. I was like, the salad dressing, that's made with soy oil. Everything was soy oil. <laughs> but here's a guy who swore to me, to my face, 
beautiful French accent, expensive restaurant. We did you say, oh yeah, it's olive oil, it's olive oil. Folks, it's your right to know what's in your food and you have to be forceful with these restaurants. If I wouldn't have grabbed his arm and said, she's gonna start itching and we're gonna have to go to the hospital, he would have never checked. And the fact is he may have even known, but when you go to a restaurant and you say, well, what are you serving? Something cheap or something expensive, soil versus olive oil? They're, they wanna feel proud. They wanna be like, well, of course we don't serve those. Like, folks, restaurants will hide stuff. Restaurants will hide stuff and not wanna tell you stuff because they're ashamed and they know they shouldn't be serving. Teresa says, that's why we choose our restaurants wisely. Yes, you have to choose your restaurants wisely. Get to know the chef. Get to really know the chef, understand their philosophy, get to know the owner, understand their philosophy. Um, peek into the kitchen, totally peek into the kitchen. So we were in, we were in Miami last year for the Super Bowl. We were down there for a conference. And we were at this a taco something, whatever this place was, hot happening restaurant. And they put proudly on their signs, no GMOs, no GMOs, GMO free, ban, right? I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm sitting there, we're sitting at the bar. And I'm like, looking at their bar products, I'm like, they're serving Coke, they're serving this, they're serving, you know, grenadine. And I'm like, those are all GMOs. So I'm like, this restaurant has a sign right there and it's all GMOs behind the bar. I'm like, this is a scam. So I'm looking over and I see the dessert station. And I look at some of the products, the dessert station's on the floor, right? The kitchen, the station's there, you know, to sell more dessert, it's a great idea. But I'm looking at all the cheap ingredients that they're using in the dessert station. So I call over the manager, I'm like, you're GMO free, but I see a lot of GMOs here. Oh, no, no, that's, that's not for the bar, it's, it's, it's for the food, is what he tells me. But most people would have never had that conversation with the manager, never, they would have never questioned, he would have said, oh wow, this is GMO free, I'm eating healthier. So I looked and I said, well, over there, your dessert station, that's GMO free and that's GMO free and that's, and he's like, he gets mad at me. He's like, well, what do you know? I'm like, listen, those are not GMO free products. Those, those have, G I mean, that's like cheap cream you're using. Like I can guarantee you that there's, there's bovine growth hormone in that cream, that cheap branded cream you're using, right? Right off the bat, that's a red flag. And I said, so what kind of oil are you cooking with? And I started asking him more questions and he got upset and he actually kicked us out of the restaurant. They wouldn't serve us anymore. They wouldn't serve us anymore. He goes, your bill's taken care of. And I said, I've already paid my bill. You're right, it is taken care of because I paid for my bill. But I'm, I was like, but I'll take another drink. The bartender goes, I can't serve you. Stop serving us. Basically, like, you're not welcome here because you questioned our integrity. Not only did I question your integrity, I proved you wrong between your bar and your dessert station. I proved you wrong. What was the name of that restaurant, Jamie? Taco, Taco something in Miami. Taco something in Miami. Hot happening restaurant. I'm like, I proved you wrong. You know, and he was willing to buy my food. I'm like, I already paid for my food, but now you're not even giving me another drink. You tell me I have to leave. And so they told the whole restaurant staff what was going on, because now I'm upset. I'm like, listen, you, you're like misleading everybody in this place. Like the old so as I'm leaving, the, the, the hostess, they, they, they snicker at me and this and that, like, like, oh, there's that guy that was causing problems. No, I'm not the one causing problems. I'm asking you to back it up. And I even said, I said, what kind of oil are you using? What kind of this, what kind of that? And he's like, I can't tell you. I was like, so go in the kitchen. He was like, I don't know, the chef's not here. I was like, go to the kitchen, take a picture. I was like, can you show me? First he goes, no, I can't show you. I said, so go to the kitchen and take a picture of your fryer oil, of your oil you're using for your salads. Take a picture and come show me the picture. I can't do that. Like everything was like, I can't do that, I can't do that. Then stop making the claim on the wall that you're doing this. I mean, it was so, it was, I mean, it was, it was, it was one of the worst experiences ever. And I said, listen, I said, you're lucky that I'm questioning you because because if somebody else questions you, like the media outlet or something, and they prove you wrong, an undercover investigator, whatever, that's a lot more detrimental. You need to really analyze what you're putting up there. But folks, a lot of, and I've, I had a conversation with Maria Loy. Maria Loy is the famous Greek Greek chef in New York City that has her famous restaurant, that's an embassy chef for Greece. I had a conversation with her on the phone, on the phone, how her Atlantic salmon is wild. My Atlantic salmon is wild. I said, wild salmon is not, it's toxic. It's not good for you. It is not. I eat it every single day. I love my wild Atlantic salmon. And she would not understand the fact that I was trying to explain to her, it's on your menu. It's mislabeled. There's no such thing as wild Atlantic salmon. It's not. And she just argued with me and refused to listen. That happened with Tom Clicchio too. And I called him out on his beef. And then all of a sudden he gets mad at me and tells me he doesn't know who I'm he sends me a tweet, you don't know who you're messing with, a private message, and this and that. And Rick Moon, I, try, I tried to debate Rick Moon last year in person because Rick Moon is the godfather of sustainable seafood on his Twitter, Rick Moon. 
formerly involved in Oceana in New York City. I followed him for years because he was a sustainable, the godfather of sustainability. He sold out to a salmon company, a farm salmon company. And I actually tweeted him, I'm coming to Vegas, I'm coming to Vegas, I want to talk to you about, about your sponsorship, about, about this farm salmon you're supporting, what makes a difference. And I tweeted him, he knew I was coming, I got there. And I saw Rick Moon in the kitchen. He was there. I saw him in the kitchen. I sit down at the bar. I'm like, I'm, you know, eating, drink. I'm like, I'd like to talk to Rick. Oh, what's your name? Marcus Giuliano. They come back and go, Rick's gone. I said, Rick was just there three minutes ago. Rick was just in his kitchen three minutes. Oh, he's gone for the night. So um, his chef, he, they send his chef, his chef de cuisine out. And I gave him an earful on smokes on on, wild, on farm salmon earful because their their sushi station was just run of the mill Scottish salmon highest mortality rate of any salmon industry Scottish salmon so I gave him an earful then I went into his other salmon the salmon the true north that he's getting paid all this money for and his chef looked at me he goes chef his chef goes I had no idea I was like of course you don't have any idea because Rick is getting money from true north the sponsorship so he has to now go back and backtrack what he's ever said about farm salmon and say this is different salmon so of course he's not going to tell you that because you're sitting here the godfather of salmon serving the worst salmon farm salmon out there it's like that doesn't make sense i was like so even folks even these celebrity chefs even these celebrity chefs will mislead you especially when it comes to money and, and getting sponsorships martha stewart she's in bed with true north too she got lots of money from true north and she's out there on her boat like oh this is my home in maine and here's true north salmon farm and i love what they do and this is so wild and pristine and natural and pure folks she was paid too by true north to make those videos you go on some of her sh on some of her, her shows she's saying her cooking true north oh i was never a believer in farmed salmon before but until i discovered true north they're my neighbors in maine and i just i love going out on the boat and this and that and there's their folks there's money involved martha stewart was in jail for a reason and she'll probably she would do it again totally do it in there's money these people get turned on by all this money and they sell out so you can't even trust some of these big shot chefs either because they run for the money um there was a um one of the podcasts that i follow who does restaurant unstoppable he posted a couple weeks ago hey i got an opportunity to get a big sponsorship from a company that i'm not too sure matches with my with my beliefs so what should i do guys he put it out to his community and i said don't take the money and he goes thank you marcus i needed to hear that don't take the money. Folks, we could take the money tomorrow. We could turn around and I could say, I found this sustainable farm salmon. I found this great product in China that's so different from other products in China. I found this, I found that, or I have this. Or I could turn around and serve Budweiser tomorrow and make a, t I could t totally sell out for a ton more money on this kind of stuff. And Jamie and I have chosen not to over the years. And we really appreciate everybody who is a support to us because you help us stick to our mission. You help us. Shame and I have, again, a very strong conviction on food, extremely strong conviction on food. And that's the deal with our conviction. It's, it's, I mean, we don't waver. I mean, this is it. And because you guys are willing to support us, that is awesome. And we really, really, truly appreciate that from the bottom of our hearts because that helps us keep doing this. Because let me tell you, I don't need to buy this, this salt at $60. I can buy one of these for myself and keep it in, in the kitchen for me to use. And I don't have to pay 65 bucks a bag and I can turn around and buy a $16 bag, quote unquote, processed sea salt for the restaurant. But we don't do that. We, what we're serving you in the restaurant is what we serve ourselves. And you can, and that, that's just our, that's just our, our, um, that's been our thing since day one. That's why we opened the restaurant because we wanted to be able to eat at a restaurant that chefs weren't taking advantage of people. When I was in Colorado, the late nineties, I remember this whole thing with food fraud. I joined every association, the Colorado Restaurant Association, I joined the Chef's Collaborative, and I joined the American Culinary Federation. And I was I went to all the American Culinary Federation mixers and meet other chefs, and you'd get around all these chefs that would brag about their food costs. Well, my food cost is 22%. My food cost is, you know, this is what I do to save money. And I will never forget the one chef from the Sunbird Restaurant in Colorado. It sits up on the mountain, the Sunbird. The chef goes, I buy tilapia for two fifty a pound and I call it snapper on my menu and we charge twenty eight dollars whatever it was. He goes, I substitute tilapia in for snapper. Yes. And all these people are sitting there like like, oh wow, that's cool. I never thought the chefs, I'm like, You guys are all okay. scams. You guys are all fakes. You guys are all liars and you guys are thieves. And I quit the American Culinary Federation. I never looked back as I'm not part of this organization. I don't want to be part of these chefs. This is not what I want to do. This is the opposite of what I thought this business was. 
And folks, these guys brag about this kind of stuff. They brag to each other about getting their food costs down, making the most amount of money. I gotta tell you, a lot of times chefs are put under pressure from owners, from corporations. If your food cost is 28%, you get a bonus. 22%, you get a bonus. This happens a lot. Like, they'll tell chefs, show me the numbers and I'll give you bonuses. At that point, chefs don't care. Chefs will buy anything to, to come in under numbers. They will buy the cheapest product, they will do whatever, they will, they, they, just because their bonus, again, they're selling out for their bonus. They're selling out for their bonus, and I never wanted to be in that position, and that's why we opened Aroma Time, because I never wanted to sell out for a bonus. I never wanted to sell out to anybody, anything. So what we serve here, I answer to. Like, like when, I, when I go to buy something, that's, I'm, I'm the judge of what we buy. It's not because I have to look at my boss and say, oh man, I can't afford this, I gotta buy something cheaper and, 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 and make it, it's not like that. And that's why Jamie and I opened Aroma Time, because I, I couldn't work for anybody. There's no way I could work for anybody. My last couple jobs, no way, I did not want to be part of that. And not, okay, so not want to be, I got criticized at one of the country clubs I worked at, at Bonnie Breyer. Um, I had bought a couple of organic things. And the GM or the, the operations manager comes to me and goes, just so you know, this isn't a spa. And but in the meantime, they hired me to be a restaurant chef in a country club and be innovative and doing what I was doing in Colorado. So they hired me to do that. So I'm getting some of these ingredients and this and that. And he goes, just so you know, this isn't a spa. This is a country club. I'm like, you'd be surprised how much tofu we're selling right now and how much veggies and how much stuff we're selling right now. Just look at the reports. We're selling this stuff. But that's the mentality. It's like, save money. I don't care. Just save the money, save the money, and serve the food. And it's unfortunate because this is, this is the corporate America structure. This is corporate America right here. Every single restaurant, whether it's corporate or not, has that same mentality. Save, 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 save. I, you know, if you walked into Restaurant Depot and walked around there and hung out there, you'd see all these chefs, sometimes very well-known chefs, walking in from very well-known Hudson Valley restaurants, and you just look at their card and what they're buying. It's a real eye-opener. I walk in there, and there's like like five things that we can buy from them. Um, so um, there's a couple of good things that, that I'm like, okay, cool, I, I can I can buy that. Um, but not very often at all. And a lot of them are like paper products, disposables, maybe our biodegradable, one of our biodegradable chemicals, dish chemicals, is what we're buying from there. Um, it's not like I'm going there and stocking up on beef and broccoli and, and all this kind of stuff. If it's a pinch, you know, a case of broccoli might work, but it's, you know, it's, it's it, you'd go there and you'd be shocked of who's buying what. All right, folks, I've got to get some work done. Um, thank you everybody for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Again, drop some comments so other people can see this video. Um, and get aware and just eat, just, you are what you eat, eat better quality food. And um, that's it. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for the support and we hope to see you soon. Heidi, if you're still on, I'm really serious. Come down and, or if anybody else, do you want to try the salt? I will get you some of the salt to try. It's a little learning curve when you start seasoning with it. It's a little different, but I'm more than happy to, to get anybody a sample of this. So, all right, folks, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it and we'll talk to you later.